Companies operating in today's global economy really need to get an understanding of the international geopolitical risk landscape. At Infortel Worldwide, we work with our clients on solving risk before it starts. Welcome to the Riskology Podcast, where we're looking at managing business risk globally and really understanding the geopolitical risk landscape. So welcome everyone to the next episode of Riskology by Infertal, where we dive into the world of risk, economics, investment, really, you name it, anything that could fall under the umbrella of risk, we are here to talk about it. Ian and I are excited today because we've got another guest and we like to get different perspectives from all over the world, all over the country. Ian's in California, I'm in Washington, DC. We've even gotten compliance and advice from the Hill Country of Texas, but today we're really excited because we've got Soji Apampa from Nigeria. Soji, welcome to Riskology. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. And so Soji is the founder and CEO of several organizations with a track record of doing a lot of great work in the space of integrity, anti-corruption, and an environment that I imagine can be tough to do that type of work. He's an Aspen Institute fellow. He's worked with the United Nations, the Center for International Private Enterprise, and so we're really, really excited to get your perspective on some of these risk issues that Ian and I have been discussing. Soji, before we kick off, do you want to maybe tell us a little bit about your background and sort of the work that your organizations have been doing? Yeah, I started life as a civil and structural engineer, and it was returning to Nigeria in 1991, frustrated that I couldn't really push engineering the way I wanted because it was who you knew. It was who you were ready to pay and so on that I decided to just work for myself after a while. And even in working for myself, I found that all my competitors were involved in trade mis-invoicing. They were under-invoicing in order to be able to pay very low duties and so on. That was the order of the day. And even there, I was totally frustrated before I was challenged by an old man who happened to be the Swedish ambassador, for me to think of something and do wow. something. And that's how the organizations were founded. We started with the Integrity Organization. And my project for the private sector was called the Convention on Business Integrity. But then I got a chance to stand in front of a chamber of commerce before the council and invite them to join us in this movement to do something about corruption. And I was shocked when the older generation said, young man, anti-corruption is anti-government. Where mm. do you think our business comes from? Wow. We can't get involved in that kind of thing. So again, even that was frustrating. But I then had a few people giving me their cards saying, look, what you're saying is the right thing. That's the way we should be going. Anytime you need our help, call on us will open the doors. And really, that's how it began. And it began really as a challenge from the old man who was the Swedish ambassador. I didn't really take it as seriously until the man took ill, was rushed to Sweden. He died and he didn't come back. And then I took it that, look, this man spent a lot of months in his dying days trying to pass a message. And that's when, for me, it became like a call, not something... You don't just start an NGO. This now is a lifelong quest yes. to try to do something about this subject. So that's how I got mixed up in all of this. But then I've <laughs> since done a master's in governance and finance from Liverpool John Moores University. And I'd also been in business and computing, working for SAP. I was the managing director for Nigeria for a period. Wow, that's an incredible origin story. And, and I can tell... Looking at it as a challenge, I'm sure you felt at certain moments that it was much more of a challenge than in other moments, but I, I can imagine over the years you've seen and heard it all. You know, one of the things that we focus on or we focused on heavily lately is looking at breakdowns within organizations and breakdowns in terms of compliance or things going wrong. And really at the end of the day, a lot of it comes down to culture and the cultural norms that are set in the community of a company, of an organization or a region. How much have you seen that shift or change throughout your career in terms of where the culture started at the beginning of your origin story to where we are today? I think within the bigger corporates, things have improved. In the old days, you know, it was in the days when it was tax deductible in France and Germany, 
to give a bribe in Nigeria. That was tax deductible. Before the OECD came up with the prohibition of bribing of foreign public officials. So in those days, it was therefore seen as part of what you did to get business in certain environments. But that kind of blatant behavior has sort of like disappeared. Okay. And you at least now have head offices around the globe trying their best to herd the cats, as it were, and get everybody to go in the same direction. But you could see the effort on their part to at least get a compliance program going and get compliance at the local level to the requirements. So I've seen that journey, but I don't think it's far enough, unfortunately. So yes, there's been a big change, but a lot still is left yes. undone. So for example, if you were to do a bright payers index, you would still find the same countries that I was talking about before the OECD law came into place. You will still find the same countries stopping the charts. You will find the US there. You find the UK there. Yeah. You'll find France, you'll find Germany, and today you'll also find China. So if you look at the geopolitical positioning, it's always as though, oh, we're clean. It's China that's rough and dirty in the way that they behave. But it's no real difference in terms of what we see on the ground. But we know that everyone is afraid of the FCPA. Yeah. So if you're in the oil and gas industry, don't even think about it because they will catch you. And when they do, it will cost you so many times more than the bribes that you're giving or the business that you're getting. So don't even try it. You get those areas. Today, we also have the fear of the UK Bribery Act. Yeah. And I know that that has spurred a whole movement in the maritime sector, for instance, uh, giving birth to the Maritime Anti-Corruption Network that has done some fantastic work in Nigeria using collective action to reduce the bribes and the demands for bribes that vessel captains face coming to this jurisdiction. So I've seen a lot of change take place, but it's still a lot of work that we all still need to keep doing in order to keep it on the straight and narrow, which is why I talked about herding cats. Yes, <laughs> I think that's a great analogy. Yeah. I think you made a really important point that a lot of people can quickly lose sight of in terms of thinking about international jurisdictions. It's not as though corruption and bribery exists in a vacuum. It requires interaction between different cultures. And so a lot of times, as you mentioned, those at the top of the list, primarily in the West, think, well, that's a problem over there. But the ones that are actually conducting business in those regions are from those countries that are sitting at the top of the list. So I think that's an important dynamic that is a lot of times lost when you focus solely on those lists, like the fat of gray lists and things like that. It's not as simple or, as or that. Or the TI, Corruption Perceptions Index. Exactly. Yes. It really requires collaboration. Good to hear, though, that you've seen pockets where the regulatory enforcement really has made an impact, because that's always a concern in the U.S. is how much regulation to implement, how to go about it. I think what we've seen lately, particularly in the FCPA space, is a lot of collaboration with local governments and the U.S. government on the enforcement. And I think that's starting to make a much more informed way to sort of enforce the laws that we have on the books. You know, one of the other areas that we hit on typically in this podcast is sort of geopolitics in general and how relations are shifting around the world. So I'd love to bring Ian into the conversation to sort of talk about your perspective, Ian, but then I think it would be great to hear Soji's take on some of the things that you've been discussing lately. No, absolutely. I mean, it's encouraging to hear some of the positive changes that have happened. I remember I was at a ACAMS conference about 10 years ago when I was still in grad school. And this was a Association of Certified Anti-Money Laundering Specialists conference, and it was in Las Vegas. And I remember very vividly, there was a fairly large contingent of compliance officers from Sub-Saharan Africa who wanted to know more about how to combat corruption. And what was interesting is that there was a, a real earnestness among the group on how to implement best practices, how to sort of filter out politically exposed persons, how do you report that in systems governmental systems where that's kind of tolerated. And what was interesting is that there was a real desire 
that was palpable among the compliance officers from Africa as opposed to the ones from the U.S. and Europe, which kind of just were like, eh, we're not really interested in compliance. And I'm curious, before COVID, where was the real demand in sub-Saharan Africa, specifically Nigeria, because Nigeria is a huge economic engine for the continent. Where was the origin for that demand for anti-corruption and best practices and cleaning that up? Was it bottom-up private sector? Was it reformers within the government who were really driving it? Or was it sort of the grassroots itself? And then how has that changed post-COVID? Because ever since the pandemic, it seems like everyone's hyper-focused on demanding just governments do better. (laughs) In just about every country in the world, it looks a little different from one region to another, one country to another. But how has that changed since the pandemic? Okay, so before the pandemic, the prime drivers were the citizens. And well, maybe I should qualify that by saying civil society groups. They were the ones pushing to reduce the levels of corruption, primarily. Okay. Now, post-COVID, you know, during COVID, we had near what was like riots with hungry citizens asking for palliatives. They've been locked down. They can't buy food. And these are the people who depend on day trade, daily trade. Whatever they made for the day is what they lived on. Mm -hmm. So now, under a lockdown, not able to do anything, they were going hungry. And their families were going hungry. So they broke into government warehouses. And we found out that lots of things that had been provided to be distributed to the people never got to them, or rather the politicians preferred to hold on to them and try to resell. So with that sort of thing, again, after COVID, it's the people who have continued to demand better government. And right now in Nigeria, we are, well, should I say towards the ends of protests, Mm -hmm. which had erupted with the hashtag end bad governance. So again, it's a demand primarily from the people. However, having said that, there's also a very high social tolerance for corruption because the same politicians who steal, when you have the anti-corruption agencies now go after them, their community will shield them and say, well, you said he stole our money. It's our money. He's our son. So we're not going to let you take him. And they form like a human shield around these people. So it's a bit confusing and it's a little schizophrenic in society with them at the same time. And this has been well documented by a gentleman called P.P. Ake. He has colonialism and the two republics. Talking about ordinary citizens still seeing government as no man's land. Yeah. So if you go out into government or the governance space and you bring something back for your community, you're to be knighted because they've mashed us up into this geography of which we don't really have a stake. But if the same person were to steal from their own community directly, then they could be lynched. But stealing from government, that's like no man's land. It means nothing. Because we used to have our own little traditional kingdoms, our own little fiefdoms, where we knew how to remove a tyrant and bring on a new leader. But now with this Western created thing, we have no control. We have no say. We don't know how this thing is supposed to work. So it's a mixture of good behavior and anarchy that we're always managing in this kind of context. And therefore, in a place like Nigeria, you cannot come and say, I am the big international and I am going to do my compliance on my own and I will succeed. No, you will be at risk. Mm -hmm. You've got to get into collective action because with the best intention in the world, you can't cover all bases. Secondly, if you rely on stakeholder activism, Like I told you, it's a bit schizophrenic. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're for the right thing. Sometimes they promote the wrong thing. And on the government side, well, again, it depends on which politicians. Sometimes they do the right thing. Sometimes they don't do the right thing. Therefore, it has to be eccentric to all those groups and collective 
in order to get something that fits the context. So in this context, you need collective action. And in the maritime sector, that's precisely what has happened, where the big shipping companies came together with local private sector, with local civil society, and the government to try and fashion out a way forward. And we've slowly moved from when everything was discretionary to a situation now where there are standard operating procedures, where there are timelines for activities to happen, where you can have greater predictability in cost and time. So now you know if your vessel is getting to Anchorage, it won't take six hours anymore. It's 90 minutes to get to birth from Anchorage. That kind of certitude. You also now know very clearly what the standards are. Therefore, the captains can prepare their checklists and try to comply with the law before they come to the country so there's less opportunity to demand the bribes. And even if an official then still demands a bribe, there's a help desk managed by civil society that will help to escalate the issues to government. So you're not alone. It's not you, the captain, alone. Not a single company on their own. It's now an industry-wide thing where the industry as a whole is working with civil society and local business to strengthen compliance with the acceptance and support of the local government to make it happen. So you need those kinds of collectives in order to ensure compliance in this kind of regime. So it doesn't depend on which official you meet, whether they are willing to do the right thing or they're the sort that's not ready to do the right thing. Great examples there. And, and I'll turn it over to you, Ian, in just a second. But one of the things that we try to stress with our clients is really making sure that you have a deep understanding of what's going on on the ground in the investment market that you're planning to go into, because you could have a solid game plan on the table. You can have all your rules and regulations that you're used to following. But if you don't understand the local dynamics, it's just never going to work. And you're going to be, as you mentioned, a, a victim to the risks that are inherent. It's great to hear that that collective approach has been working in certain sectors. And I think, you know, as you mentioned, the schizophrenic nature of the sentiment I think is, unfortunately, it seems to be popping up in circles around the world, even here in the U.S. But I do love the term that you pointed out, and bad governance. I definitely want to see more of that as a takeaway. But Ian, I wanted to turn it back over to you as well. Yeah, I mean, hashtag and bad governance. Yeah, I, I, I'm loving that one. Yeah. <laughs> it needs to be a bumper sticker in every language. Right. In every yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting because if you look at anti-money laundering laws and anti sort of bribery laws, anti-terrorist financing laws. After 9-11, they just proliferated all over the world. And countries just sort of adopted literally copy and paste texts from legislation and laws that were developed in the UK and the US in the 1980s and 1990s. And they're just like, well, we're just going to, that's going to work in Brazil. And this is going to work in Nigeria and Ethiopia and India. And that's just not the way it works. It's not tailored to the culture. Those norms are not going to make any sense structurally or culturally in any sort of fashion. But then it's interesting how, despite that sort of massive failure, on the one hand, you're talking about shipping, where if you can just tick a box in sort of high finance, it's almost kind of abstract, it could be overlooked. But if you don't get that right in shipping, stuff's not going to move. <laughs> Daily life is going to stop. Yeah. So, of course, you're yep. going to have to have good relationships between shippers, locals, and local governance, where if it doesn't work right, it's toilet paper and food are not going to move, and daily life is going to get really bad really fast. So it's interesting that you have this sort of bottom-up norm where you have a necessity on the part of businesses and locals and consumers and local governance to actually move the stuff and get it right in a way that's clean and transparent so that daily life is possible. And I think that's just such a juxtaposition between what happened with banking on the one hand and I would say the real economy on the other where you actually have a real process emerging to sort of combat corruption. Cool. So in terms of future outlook, Soji, we don't like to get the crystal ball out and fully predict the future, but 
What would you say in terms of the next five years, how things are looking from a bribery corruption standpoint in Nigeria and then sort of regionally, you know, where do you see things going? I think that if you are measuring perception, then you probably will not perceive the change. But if you are looking at real structural change on the ground, I expect that there will be more collective action. Let me give you, for example, between 2019 and now, in that collective action in the maritime sector, 2019, there were 266 cases, reports by ship captains of attempts by government officials to collect large, unreceited cash payments wow. in U.S. dollars from them, 266. But after the things that we collectively put in place, that fell in the year of COVID to 128 cases. And we thought, well, maybe that's because the officials are too timid because of COVID to go on board and rummage the vessels. But then in 2021, it fell again to 84 cases. Wow. Okay. 2022 to 48 cases. Last year, it was 45 cases. That's incredible. And industry is saying there used to be an on cost, severe on cost of like $150,000 for visiting a port in Nigeria. Today, on average, it's $20,000. So you can see the sharp reduction in the costs because of all the disputes with the government officials, the wrangling over whether or not there has been a contravention, which is the favorite strategy for getting you over a barrel and then demanding the payment. So it's always, they never demand upfront, never. It's always some contravention that then leads because the captain is now panicking that every single day that the vessel is going off charter and working out how much that will cost against the demand being made by the officer, it's easier to just pay and go. So I believe that you will see more of those sorts of collectives and therefore things reducing gradually and there will always be a lag before the perceptions then follow and before the indices then begin to change but i think that fundamentally there's an opportunity for this to continue over the next five years this is not only nigeria parts of what we did in nigeria are now being replicated by the suez canal authority in egypt part of it also being replicated in a port in india with Pakistan and Bangladesh also mm -hmm. under study. Ukraine also started some reforms before the war. And now Ghana has also started some activities inspired by what has happened in Nigeria. So I want to say that I think really over the next five years, it will be a better picture for those on the ground. But of course, there's always a lag before it gets into the survey of surveys used for the perceptions index. Yeah, that's a really interesting dynamic. And you mentioned opportunity before. I think opportunity is a great way to frame this dynamic because when the perception has not caught up to the conditions on the ground, that actually creates opportunities that people may not realize if they're just focusing on these lists, on these perception indexes. So it sounds as though, in a way, Nigeria has served as a model for some other countries and regions that have been struggling even more so. And so I think that's really interesting. We're running up on sort of the end of time here at this episode, but I thought I'd give you the opportunity, Soji, just to sort of speak to our listeners in terms of anyone who's thinking of investment in Nigeria, what would you recommend? I would recommend the same thing you would do if you were going to visit a new country on your own, you've never been there, get a guide, find out who a reliable guide is, and get a guide, because the learning curve would be very steep. You need to understand the context to know how you can do business successfully without getting into any of the booby traps. So get a guide, a good guide, and you'll be fine. I love it. I couldn't think of a better way to end the podcast, Soji. We've really enjoyed having you. Hopefully we can talk again soon. Thank you so much for having me.